I hadn't even thought about Mojo in years. I forgot about mm-hmm. it. And then I hear it one time and it's stuck in my head for two f- days. Like that's, that's Same. yeah, that's what these songs are. Welcome to every album ever with Mike and Alex. My name is Michael Mansour, and I'm joined again this time over Skype by my lovely, wonderful, and stricken with the flu co-host, Alexander Volt. Say hello. Extra raspy today. Indeed. This is every album ever, the podcast where we listen to every single album in the world, one artist at a time. That's a whole new discography, even even tiny cheating episodes like this one. Um uh, what, what the hell was I going to say? I lost, my, I lost the intro. Uh, I believe you asked me who we'll be talking about today, and I say we'll be continuing our adventure down the Mike Patton universe and covering his little side project, Peeping Tom. Peeping Tom, there we go. The One of his gajillion, million, gabillion side projects. Um, could you, could you even call them side projects when it's Mike Patton? They're just what he's doing at the moment before he moves on to the next thing? Yeah, they're pr- pretty much, you know, his solo albums, but he felt the need to name them something else. So, And sometimes he'll do it with just another band, as he often does, or just starts a whole new band and then tours with that band. And then, then it feels weird. Then it feels weird to call it a Mike Patton thing because Tomahawk is, is not a Mike Patton thing, but it's a Mike Patton thing. At least, um, like, same with like Dead Cross. At least, like Dead Cross, uh, uh, Tomahawk, Phantom Oss, they have more than than one album. So yeah, those are full bands. But yeah, this one. I mean, it seemed like this was going to be one of his bands, or one of his things, and then they just did the one album, and then never again. And. This is a weird one. Peeping Tom is a weird one. Obviously, it's one album, so we're trying to give us a little bit of space. We have a big, giant discography coming on a couple of weeks, and we're trying to give us some some breathing room, so that's why we're doing this little tiny one. And we already did, covered Mr. Bungle, so we've opened the floodgates for Mike Patton. Go check out the Mr. Bungle episode. We love Mr. Bungle. Obviously, big Mike Patton fans. What are your thoughts on Peeping Tom? Um, I, I love him. This was a, a nice trip down memory lane. It's been a, a bit since I've I've listened to Peeping Tom. Um, Ali's uh, like Patton collaborating with those uh, these weirdos from from Anticon. And uh, quick shout out to Jamil from the Sonic Cloth podcast. Where uh, if you guys like some of this uh, stuff, check out the episode I did where we talked about Anticon as well as uh, we didn't talk about it, but uh Patton also did this project 13 and God with like the anti con guys so um I always mm-hmm. thought that was a weird little corner of the music universe um they're uh you know featured kind of sparingly here but um only Mike Patton would listen to those guys and be like let me put you on my version of pop music and that's what this album is. It is that's how it's always it's been you know marketed as. It's Mike Patton doing pop music, but it's also fucking not pop music. <laughs> I mean, it's it is, but it's not. I mean, it is in in a very shallow sense. Uh, it's like the things that you would you would find things in here in pop music. But you would never hear this and lump it with pop music. I don't think. Yeah, I think like a uh, a good example is the uh, what song is it? Oh, the are we gonna jump into the music already? Oh yeah, I guess I I guess I'm good. I'll I'll wait till we get there. But there is like a good example where like a pop song is referenced, but I don't think it would go over with that pop music's artist fans. No, no, I I mean. Fucking no. I mean, and, and if you've listened to a good amount of, of Patton, this thing just reeks of Pattonisms with obviously the, the crazy vocal stuff. But one thing that I, I, I'm as a general thing that I'm, I'm surprised because I, I listened to this album a ton. I was a huge fan of it uh, like a decade ago. Haven't heard it in a long, long time. Went back to it um, and didn't love it nearly as much as I used to. I still like it. I think it's, I think it's a good album. But there's like things about it that I find so like corny like it, it, the most of all the fucking lyrics holy god 
like it's like he's trying to sing lyrics the way a pop artist would would write lyrics or or like write about the things that they would write about in the verbiage that they would write it in and it's like I've we've heard Patton's lyrics before. They're not stupid lyrics. Like you listen to Faith the More lyrics. They're they're interesting lyrics. These are not. It, it, I find these to be weirdly bad. I disagree because I think don't even trip, Alex. You're disagreeing with don't even trip. Yes, yes. <laughs> can't, can't believe I called you my amigo. He says that in the song, dude. Yeah. <laughs> these are ridiculous lyrics. Yeah, and it it fits. It's a uh, a light-hearted affair. In many ways, it, it is. Uh, we have a look, some notes here from our boy Tom Osmond. You should go go support and follow. Um, he pulled this stuff from faithandmorefollowers dot com, and it has you know it's various quotes, uh, some press release stuff, and uh, yeah, I mean this. I might as well go into the, some of the backstory. The the amount of guests here are fucking ridiculous. There's a gajillion guests on here. This is and, uh, this is like Mike Patton's version of Handsome Boy Modeling School because there's a lot of like Dan the Automator production as well as basically every song has a guest artist on it. Definitely. Also, Dan the Automator, we we didn't didn't uh, mention Lovage. That was another very similar to Peeping Tom type project. Mm-hmm. Uh, I I I mean, I've only heard it once or twice years and years ago. Am I mistaken in my memory that that was mostly a Dan the Automator thing and just a little bit of Mike Patton? Ah, uh, yes, it was mostly <coughs> Dan the Automator. Uh, I did not, I did not come here ready to talk about Lovig, although I should. Who is? No one talks about. I should. It's such a weird, like interesting, almost like super. Uh, well, I, I guess it was you know headed by Dan the Automator, but you know. Mm-hmm. You know, Mike Patton was featured prominently on that yeah, album. Yeah, still very much considered one of his projects, uh, or at least a thing he was heavily involved in. Yes, but that that yeah, that reminds me of that because that that's another one that could be considered accessible in a, in a in a not traditional Patton screaming in, with his mic down his throat type of way, or not complete Italian uh, uh, pop songs like his, the other end of his extreme spectrum. Um but this one yeah this one it's like i mean there is hip-hop on here like hip-hop artists on here we got fucking cool keith on here i mean holy shit dude but it does feel like if Patton made a hip-hop album i don't really get hip-hop vibes from this album as much as i do really like it's more trip-hop to me and Again, with me fucking not even understanding what trip hop is, <laughs> like that's where that comes. Because obviously he's not rapping on it. There's only some rapping on it. Uh, I suppose that would fit the trip hop thing, though, wouldn't it? Yeah. It's just hip hop oh, oh. bass or uh, it's, beats. It's but like, with yeah, it's like using the tools of hip hop <clears throat> and making it like accessible for like down tempo white people, maybe moody white people. Um, if I, a bit. this isn't quite as moody as like, I mean, massive attack is on here, but it's not, it's not like dreary or depressing at all. No, no, not at all. And yeah, it's just like, yeah, Dan, the automator's here. Cool. Keith is here. Kid Koala is here. Um, you know, Nora Jones, <laughs> Nora Jones is here. I like once in a while, Nora Jones is like, I'm going to let my freak flag fly. I think she should do it more often, but, uh, yeah. Also, yeah. um, you know, she wouldn't have monies then like she has now. So yeah, yeah, you take some, you take some, some bad with that, definitely. Um, so yeah, this was a uh, patent trying fucking pop, and the name Peeping Tom came from a 1960 uh, horror film. Of course, that- of course it does. I'm surprised it's not a Gallo film. Uh, have you seen Peeping Tom? I have not. I actually saw it years and years it, because of this band. I was got curious. Um, to be fair, Phantomus also inspired me to watch a bunch of those movies from the 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 final cut. Or is that what it's called? The final cut, the director's cut. I forgot director's the name of the album. Cut. I think it's director's, director's cut. cut. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is not the first time Mike Patton inspired are, me to watch old ass movies. Are there actual spacemen in the movie? 
There is not even it's not even close. There's nothing at all zany about it. It's just a I'm dude. Still gonna, I'm still gonna watch. It's still yeah, it's good. It's a it's a horror psychological horror dude who um, likes filming his victims before he kills them and stuff. Um, very general overview of it, but it, it was good. I I don't remember loving it or hating it. I think I was just like, oh, that's cool. Let's see on the on the yeah on this press release it says Padden would write songs with a wish list of theoretical collaborators in mind then hope for a reply in the form of a finished track. Um, and he quote, he's quoted as saying, it's an exotic way of working for someone accustomed to a band environment. It was charming, really. None of, none of the usual animal hall stuff. Instead of swapping spit and underwear, we were swapping files. Uh, so like he didn't meet a lot of the people. I don't think he met Cool Keith or Nora Jones at all until like years later or something yeah. like that. Yeah, it um, sounds like uh, this was like <clears throat> pre-Dropbox era where think they actually had to mail the files holy shit yeah this is like a, a bit innovative in the sense that now that shit is so common to not show up in the studio uh, and just send over a file so easy so easy but this was like yeah i remember reading about this like a, a, at least a decade ago and, and it was like it was a thing to point out like he didn't there, nobody was in the studio with him and now it's like yeah because it cost too much money to do that no one does that Six years to make this whole. Is that how long it fucking took? I mean, Jesus mm. Christ. I assume some of that has to do with the snail mail. Yeah. I mean, and yeah, the mail is one thing, but also just waiting on responses from a ton of different artists who, well, one of them is Cool Keith, and who knows what he's up to. So, yeah, he's that seems a little. <laughs> eating bland food so no one steals it. Is that what he does? That's what he does. He's, uh, <laughs> before the flavored seltzer water, he loves seltzer water because he could take it to a party and no one would touch it. <laughs> that guy's got some things to work through. <laughs> Holy I, shit. He did spend a stint in a mental hospital. I wish his discography wasn't so messy. I would love to talk about Cool Key for <laughs> hours. That would be very interesting because this was obviously my introduction to Cool Keith. I still don't know hardly anything of his. I know who he is now, of course. But... Oh, this isn't. This isn't even like. It's not a good introduction to Cool Keith. Uh, probably. I mean, it's not the. It's not even his thing. I mean, he's like on two verses in the entire album, so it's, it's probably not the best. But uh, the the main quote from from Patton about this album that I've seen circulated a million times. He says, I don't listen to the radio, but if I did, this is what I'd want it to sound like. This is my version of pop music. Uh, in a way, this is an exercise for me, taking all these things I've learned over the years and putting them into a pop format. Um, I guess pop format is the, the deal because these songs are 100% fucking verse, chorus, bridge, chorus, done, whatever. You know, the, the standard song structure. Uh, there are no... There's some moments where it's like, oh, that's interesting. I didn't see it turning out that way. But there's no wild shit here. There's not like, a, there's weirdness and there's definitely the the Mike Pad style, but there's no wild shit. Yeah, maybe it's wild to boring <clears throat> people, but um, yeah, very like interesting beats and samples and music still. And I yeah. I like the way it was formatted. Yeah, so we might as well jump into the actual album, of course, like we keep saying, just the one album, uh, which came out in 2006. 2006, man, I remember when this was new, and I don't mean because I was there when it happened. I mean, like, I was, I heard it a couple years after. I was like, oh, that's, that's a thing that he put out a few years ago, and now I feel fucking old. I can't believe how long it was. I believe I purchased the vinyl when it came out. I man. I think I have, like, a first pressing. It's got to be. I don't know what else it would be. Holy, holy shit. Almost 20 years, which means, I, man, whatever. I'm just going to depress myself by thinking about this too much. But yeah, we might as well jump into it. So you ready? I'm ready. Hell yes. This is 2006's self-titled. I fucking forgot like how cool and unique this particular song is it's yeah i i can kind of almost remember 
how uh, my, my reaction when I first heard it years and years ago and being like, oh, interesting. Right. Kind of a, a little bit of a trip hop spy James Bond kind of thing. Yeah, I like that. Like Middle Eastern intro and that Nazdem aiding pattern. Yeah. Full weird hard rock weirdo stuff here. Yep. So strange. It is produced like a beast, I'll tell you that. That that chorus feels real good. That chorus feels real good. Yeah, very like excellent opener to the the album. Uh it does like this like really like groovy psychedelic breakdown eventually. Yeah. Um other other than that that breakdown where you know the double kicks come in, it's pretty straightforward and that could be said about a lot of these songs. I mean, they really just do like three parts and then rotate around those three parts and then it's over. It's um, it's it's weird music in normal music structure. Pretty much. Yeah, definitely. Um and yeah, it's like stuff it's such an interesting thing because like it's a really strong opener i'm never going to be a fan of the dj record scratchers but again when you it just i wouldn't mind if they were gone but i'm not bothered by them the stuff like that that it's just such a nice uh meaty package it's just such a fat and busy mix and then obviously his vocal stuff um there's a lot hidden in there like you can focus on one thing that he's doing because it's so abrasive and whatever, but there's like a million little voices behind there. He's doing a lot of back and forth stuff with himself. Um, it's very interesting stuff. Well, I think that the like back and forth stuff is also aided by odd Nostum. Like, well, I don't mean just on that song. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah. But on the song, it does sound really good with, with um, of course I can't pronounce the fucking game. odd Nostum. There we go. Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's hell of an opera. And then the the main single was uh, was Mojo, which the music video I believe featured Danny DeVito, which is pretty sick. I need to watch that music video. Um, and yeah, that was the song I wanted to bring up earlier because you know the lyrics are invoking Britney Spears. Oops, I did it again. Um, yeah, but but that but. You you gotta you gotta give it to me the the lyrics in the chorus I mean come on what is he, what if he's not being ironic which I hope he is I mean because yeah. those are so corny I mean yeah it's ironic it's obviously like he's saying like this is his version of pop music it's it's not even like subtly invoking Britney Spears it's so obvious that it is um. And then, yeah, I think just, like, Dan, the automator, like, quietly being, like, a pop producer who doesn't, like, work in pop music, being mm -hmm. here also helps that. Um, big fan of, like, Razelle and, and Mike Patton working together. They work together on Bjork's acapella album, Medulla. Um, oh, cool. Yeah, so, like, um, I think like the, even though Rozelle is like a acapella DJ, if you want to call him that, um, I think like, you know, the DJs they did bring on here are like very interesting DJs to me. So yep. Mojo, when I hear that, I mean, I still like the song, even the fact, the fact, cause a lot of the, I could say about that song, what I could say about a lot of the songs where I don't understand, I don't think they're like that good. They're that well-written. I don't think there's anything that creative about them from a writing standpoint, but there, I think they come out really good and they, they're just really infectious and super catchy. Um, and it ends up making this album weirdly re-listenable. Re Gotta but get my it, mojo rice. Yeah. It's just, it's good. And then, but, but when I hear it, I hear 2006. I hear so much 2006. I think it's, it, it hasn't aged the best, but it's still pretty fun. There's really only one song where I felt like, it showed its age, and even then, maybe because I I came up in the 
the age, it was kind of nostalgic. So me personally, I, d- I don't mind it so much. Which song is that? Uh, gonna do a bit of jumping around. It's Kill the DJ, the, <laughs> the one with Massive Attack. It's Massive Attack. It's way more rocking than I thought it would be. Um, it does capture like that e- unique electronic music sound in like the mid aughts um it would be perfect on like a ps2 game although i guess we were on our way to ps3 by now um yeah it's it's not bad but like it's not mike Patton and massive attack at their peaks either like that's just kind of a lot of weight like massive attack and mike Patton needs to like be a home run and it's not it this kind of scratches some some nostalgia for me i don't like it at all it's the only song on the album that i actually don't like um in in some way where i mean i, I think the those those home, those harmonized vocals in the intro that kind of return they sound really mm-hmm. cool but it never stuck with me and then um when i first heard this i had no context of massive attack i'd never I, I I'll be lucky if I, I'll be surprised if I actually listen to Portishead at that point, but no context didn't. And so now going back, like oh, Massive Attack's on a track. I forgot what the song sounds like. I'm excited again, and then was probably let down as the only song on the album that I actually don't like. Um, yeah, it's it's I guess. Well, it's, I mean, it's not horrible, but I guess you're right. It, it needed to be a lot more when you have two juggernauts yeah, like that. Yeah, I I think especially one like. Patton and Bjork working together were able to deliver like such a cool, unique project with like that's appetizing. This just is it's it's fun. It's not I don't think it's like what you or me or or fans really wanted. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I'd say that that as well. Um, going a little bit earlier where I was uh shitting all, all over don't even trip because honestly i i like the song i like the song fine <laughs> the the title and the lyrics remind me it in a way of a dude who's like a little too old to be trying to get in with like the young kids but trying to speak their language that the whole song feels like that to me uh literally. i i love i know that assholes grow on trees but i oh oh yeah I know yeah, that I'm going to trim the leaves. <laughs> yeah, I love it. I love it's like blending funk with like these darker trip hop things. Yeah. Um. It's just I don't know. I don't know. To me, I could see that being like another single, not like you know, yeah. a Mike Patton project needs singles because it's probably just going to sell to weirdos, anyways. Well, they try to do with this one, and they didn't pick that as a single, which I'm actually surprised by. Um, uh, yeah, I think the whole like "don't even trip" thing also this kind of fits that that vibe of the album too. Of there's like these '60s aesthetics to the album, but then it also feels like this like early 2000s vibe. Definitely. Um, even though I do like the song, it's like. The the writing across the board for the, I would say has this layer of like simplicity to it that I don't like, and even with don't even trip where it's like I feel like I've definitely heard that somewhere. Not the way it's pulled off, of course. Not the not the his vocal lines really open it up and make it um, super duper hooky. And then obviously the production is ridiculous and very cool. But like structurally, I have so much like like really that's just kind of average. I feel like this is an album of average songs that are made very good just by sheer charisma and, and like, I guess talent, I would, I guess, but, um, it's like, I shouldn't like any of this album. I should, I should, I feel like I should hate this album, but I, I really like it. Uh, it's just odd. I just think for a dude like Patton, who has very dense music, it's just really nice to have this digestible crunch. Yeah, yeah, I was I was certain I wouldn't like it too when I first heard it, but yeah, it wasn't the case. Um, we the song we got Cool Keith on is Getaway, which if I had to pick a favorite off the album, I'd pick that one. Yeah, I think 
it kind of falls in the same category as the massive attack thing where like I feel like Cool Keith saves his best verses for himself whenever he's featured on a a project like Sonic Youth or Yeah Yeah Yeahs or or Mike Patton. He's always there more for like a vibe. He's not going to he's not gonna deliver like his A game on a feature. Um, yeah, I was warning. I thought about that. I, I didn't know. I'm glad you're saying that because I never. Um, every time I uh, I went back to this with the knowledge of Cole Keith, I always always like confused at how kind of bland the, his his verses are here. He he's a, a maniac who I don't even think he really has any contemporaries. Like he's this uh, a a rapper who exists in his own realm. Uh, just a, a like fascinating, fascinating character, and yeah, I think I think like I said, I think when people have him on, it's just kind of to to like check a box, kind of get like his unique voice. I think I think because uh, that that the Prodigy song like "Smack My Bitch Up" is so, or you know, was so popular like reverberated through pop culture that like just hearing like cool Keith's voice kind of like had like maybe a bit of a placebo effect uh uh-huh. so yeah i do i do like how dirty and fuzzy uh some of the electronic stuff is on there Definitely. I, do, I do like the it almost has like a noir feel to it at times which kind of fits yeah. the, the getaway lyrics it's rules. I think the 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 bassy fuzzy synths sound incredible, but I think it's some of the most interesting and downright cool riffs Patton's ever done. Like just the progressions, they I like the way they go um uh harmoniously. Ah, whatever. Maybe I'll use that word. It just the 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 harmony transition from the verse to the chorus, that progression is a really smart musical progression. Um and it's one that uh I don't know. I, I I never get tired of it. But and then you bring in the production into it. It's got some really fucking fascinating sonic moments like that that outro. It's super brief, but I there's not a single fucking thing I can compare it to. It just seems like something you would hear in a video game, but not 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 when I say video game, people think like fucking uh, <laughs> beep boops and YMO and no no I, I mean like I've said this before, but Mortal Kombat. I mean, yeah, yeah. like, there's something really interesting and sinister, and it's really executed very well. Um, that that outro, especially, we got a little bit more smoothness with your neighborhood spaceman. Yes, uh, and then that features some more anti-con people. This time, Gel and Odd, mm-hmm. Nasdam. Uh, yeah, that that is like very much tapping into like. The Italian pop music that Patton's so fond of, more yep. more sixties vibes. Doesn't feel dated though. Um, I think l- lyrically, that's the most like surreal, like a dash of mysticism going on there too. Mm-hmm. I love it. I love that one, um, and it feels really good following Getaway. It feels very good following that one, and also Patton is doing all kinds of Patton-y shit here. Like um, the that bridge section, whatever the, the section after the chorus, or it's it's not, it's kind of hanging on one note, and he's doing all this very rhythmic patinisms. I don't know what you'd call it. Um, very good textures there, and, and all and also the 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 more sixty. I, mean, I don't I don't feel sixties from that, but I do get like Italian pop from there. Mm-hmm. There, uh, like, basically like soothing textures is how I would describe it. Um, yeah, I yeah, I just think when he meets up with the Anticon guys, he's gonna be like, we need some like weird back and forth rhythmic lyric stuff going on, despite it being his version of pop music. Well, speaking of the his version of pop music and as, as well as the Italian stuff, uh, <laughs> Kai Piri, Pirina, Kai Kai Piri, Kai Pirina, I don't know how to fucking say. It. Uh, track seven, the one yes. that looks different and hard to pronounce. That one, I mean, it's, it's it got fucking it's bossa nova or something. It's it's some. Hell I mean, yeah, it wouldn't be it patent if there wasn't some Italian ass shit on it. Hell yeah, you think that's like cafe music, but there's like 
these weird mm, heavy not like heavy metal but like heavy yeah. for what it is and uh like fuzzy and big big and fuzzy mm. not on like getaway um yeah yeah it's uh i appreciate the the mix up it's it sounds like nothing else on there it's good for pacing um and it's nice it's it's again it's coffee shop music but with murder synths and patinisms yeah yeah great stuff um especially because the song yeah. after that celebrity death match is just some of the weirdest obscure stuff on the album i like had to do like double checks like it's kind of interesting to hear Patton reference celebrities in his lyrics there's like mm-hmm. seahorse erotica going on they're like getting <laughs> turned on by like Keanu Reeves and Beyonce it's very been there yeah I mean who hasn't those are like two of the hottest people ever um I really I really like Kid Koala's scratching on here it's not like traditional like DJ scratching it's kind of like mellow surreal scratching which Mm -hmm. I don't think people associate with DJ scratching but uh, yeah, Kid Koala has always like functioned in that like hip hop trip hop space, able to go back and forth between both. So I think he's like the perfect DJ to bring on for this track. It's a good song. Um, I'm always just deceived by it, even the fact the I've, even though I've heard it a million times, because I don't like that first riff at all. And I, it, it starts out with this thing that I think it's gonna go like, all right, I'm not really in it. And then um, as it picks on, as it picks up, it, it goes real dark it changes feel completely and it ends up being one of the meanest and dirtiest things on the album and there are these moments i think the bass production on this track is just un, uh, unmatched there's there's these moments where it'll just hit a fucking an open uh an open bass no an open low um an e or a d or whatever the fuck uh and the way it just booms it feels so good it feels so evil and it, it really well done yeah also i was i was trying to see if anyone played on this and according to discogs it's like all all patent um i'm very interested in what is samples and what was played yeah that is interesting i remember reading a thing forever ago uh saying that that he uh he did he he doesn't have any feeling in his one of his arms because he during a faith the more show i think he like cut it by accident with a with a broken bottle um and at least what I read said that the doctors told him that um, he'd get feeling back in it, but he wouldn't be able to use it again. But the opposite happened. Mm. So the fact that he he plays bass at all or any instrument with his hands is always like, ah, oh, really? I wonder what that feels like. Yeah. Yeah. Um, Did not know that about him. Yeah. I, I, I don't believe I'm misremembering that, but eh, maybe I am. Tell me I'm an asshole in the comments. Um, completely forgot about how you feeling uh, until I heard it again. Man, again, I should hate this song. It feels super dated. It's <laughs> it, it, we uh, we were sound testing with it earlier, and it, it sounds the beginning of it sounds like it's gonna be a reggaeton song, uh, yeah. but I like it a lot. <laughs> yeah, I know when I see those one on a track, he is like the more nasally like Aah. yeah, like voice on there. Um, uh, yeah, it's so crazy. It's. I almost wanted to call it like a sound collage, but that's not right because it's not, it's not like a wall of sound, but there's, there's so much going on here and it is made like digestible. And it's just like, it is one of the most like dense songs on the album. It's this like dense and brief too. Yeah. It's, they're really like trying to paint like a clear picture of, of madness on that track. Yeah, especially that that outro. I mean, the song is two minutes forty four seconds. It, that outro where it, it just takes this whole shift with these, uh, are those, I mean, it sounds like fucking steel drums, uh, but with these giant low uh, tom hits and and fucking bass plucks. It's a very cool, very cool section. It's a very cool song. Um, Sucker is the one we got Noah Jones on. Another one, and, and as well as Down the Automator, and dude. It's, I don't know how to describe that song, but I fucking adore that chorus. Yeah, I, I'm like a fan of her voice when she like 
you know, works with people I like, like Patton or, or Danger Mouse. Um, yeah, I don't know. She's just, she's got a fucking great voice. I wish she made weird music, but you know, that's not going to pay the bills. bills. Yeah. Yep, we both went the same place. <laughs> yep. Yeah, absolutely. And, yeah. We both, but... we both know why she does what she does or like, yeah, like her dad's Ravi Shankar, like do, do a sit, a sitar album, Nora Jones, I'm begging you. Um, That'd be pretty cool. <laughs> I mean, that's fun. definitely up your alley. <laughs> also, like, you know, you already got out of your dad's shadow. Now embrace your dad's shadow. But yeah. what, do I, what do I know? I'm, you know, out here struggling with the podcast. You're rich and <laughs> successful. Um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, fair she, enough. <laughs> I don't I don't know. Whenever I see Nora Jones with an artist I like, I'm never, never disappointed. Yeah, I'm... I, it's one of my favorite songs in the album, honestly. I know there's a super short one, two and a half minutes. Um, really unique. I mean, I it's just kind of... Like, it's also kind of cool to hear her be like kind of vulgar. Yeah, yeah. It's, she's yeah, she's saying, dropping F-bombs. It's it's like sensual and smooth, but in a weird, creepy, stalkery kind of way. It's a very it's a very cool song. That sounds like Mike Patton made a song with Nora Jones. It, it, yeah, it's exactly what it is. Jesus Christ. Yeah. Uh, okay. I am fucking torn on the closer slash I, single. We're not alone. I I love it. Like Dub Trio is so talented. I don't think they get enough credit for being weirdos and blending like reggae elements with hard rock. Um, they've always been like a very cool, interesting band to me, and like to have them come together here. And uh, just like make the most, and this is like the most rock centric song on the album, so it does kind of feel out of place, but it just it works for me. I think it could have been cut, and not a lot of people would care. But to me, the song is very cool and unique. So it, I'm like right down the middle, where I love it and hate it because. I think the Dub Trio sounds fucking amazing on it. The, the verses feel absolutely amazing. Um, they're, I mean, there's super dubby, obviously. There's the Dub Trio is on it. But uh, that chorus, the chorus makes me fucking cringe. And this is the weird thing about the chorus because I, I hear it, I'm like, oh God, this is like, this is the most corny bullshit. I'm annoyed by it. And then the song, you know, the song is about five minutes long and it, and it goes on and repeats a few times. It goes through this transition uh, around three minutes in. That's fucking incredible. And then it brings back the chorus. Now, when it brings back the chorus, the it's the same chorus, but now they're adding these samples on top of it. These clean little melodic samples um, that kind of uh, they're over top the chorus, but they kind of build up and they get louder and louder. That little sample makes me love it. It's one little change, one tiny, one little, one layer change. And all of a sudden this thing that I fucking hated because I thought it was corny. I now like it and it feels really good by the end of it. It's a, it's, it's a weird song to me. I just always thought of it as like a tip of the hat to that, that old song. I think we're alone now, but you know, the same way where like, He's invoking Britney Spears, but it sounds nothing like Britney Spears. The same thing here where it's like kind of invoking. I think we're alone now, but it's just not even like it. Mm -hmm. But I mean, I, I am kind of confused that that was chosen as the second single because it feels like it has a rev. It's like a it's like a build up song. Yeah. Like I said, it is it is kind of a an interesting choice but to me it's i don't know it's so fucking cool it'd be be ashamed if it was like on the cutting floor somewhere yeah yeah i suppose so um yeah this is it's a good album i, I don't love it the way i did when i was younger but it's still really really like it's, it's just the whole thing is an earworm um things that i they think i wouldn't like i end up just humming to myself throughout the whole day like i hadn't heard I hadn't even thought about Mojo in years. I forgot about mm -hmm. it. And then I hear it one time and it's stuck in my head for two fucking days. Like that's, that's, Same. yeah, that's what these songs are. Same. 
So, so I yeah. get, I mean, it worked it, it, for what it, it was. Achieved, yeah, it achieved its goal as a Mike Patton pop album. It really did. And that's what he, um, from in 2013, he, he commented about it. Yeah, he said, uh, if there's one thing I learned from Peeping Tom, it's that working with so many collaborators takes a hell of a long time. It was challenging to be a whipcracker and a composer and be sympathetic at the same time. I didn't even meet a lot of these people until years later. Doing everything via email or an FTP site is certainly a more impersonal way of making music, but in other ways it can be more direct because you're getting unfiltered ideas. If I do another one, I change some things, but it was definitely a worthwhile experience. Uh, yeah, I mean... Maybe it wasn't like a giant mainstream hit. I mean, but who thought it was going to be? I mean, it's it was just, I mean, put out on Ipecac. It's it's Mike Patton still being weird, but with a bunch of random ass people doing his version of pop. Um, in a way, it's like a complete success. But yeah, only if you're looking at it from a creative standpoint, I'd say. I think they may have even gone on tour. Yeah, there was a tour. Dude. Yeah, I saw clips from that, and, like, it looked, like, so fun, so much fun. Like, of course, they do cover songs. They, like, it's, like, Rozelle and Mike Patton, this, like, improv shit. Like, I, w- I would like to see, like, it doesn't have to be Peeping Tom, but I think, like, Dan the Automator and, and Rozelle and Mike Patton have enough work together they could they could do another tour or like another album doesn't have to be peeping tom but i would love to see those three like work together or do some minimum do some shows together it's it's collaboration i enjoy it'd be very cool and also maybe yeah they don't have to do a, uh, they can just do another project but i think at this point if i had to just take a stab in the dark peeping tom would would have a fucking massive draw right now compared to what it was when this album came out just because this album's been around a while i've it's one of those albums that i don't know i just sort of got i don't because in a way it got it dated itself and it, it doesn't sound it's it sounds like early 2000s but also it's this weird thing that Patton did once that people would like to see again it was like I don't think I had, like, at the time, I was still a very young man, this, like, in my own world. I, so I don't remember, like, the impact it had, but it just felt like a very specific album for me at the time. Um, and there were a lot of weird projects like that. Like, um, like Dave Lombardo did an album with, like, I think it's DJ Spooky, like, that album isn't yeah dj spooky and dave lombardo did like an album together and it was just like i don't know this these like weird projects of these artists i was like getting into and kind of helped bridge that like rock connection into more like interesting absurd aspects of of hip-hop for me it's definitely absurd and in plenty of areas but it's fun. It's it's fun as hell. And uh, yeah, it's worth. I mean, it's worth a shot. I mean, yeah, this isn't going to be for everyone. It's going to be a little, a little dated, maybe for a lot of people. But does, I mean, a catchy riff is a catchy riff. I still dig I think, it. Yeah, I think like Patton fans, Anticon fans, Trip Hop fans, then the Animator fans. Yeah, you know, you just kind of got to form like Voltron on this album. Yeah, 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 but yeah, I mean that's a, that that's two down for our tackling of patent stuff. We only have seven thousand left to go. Yeah, yeah, I guess that wraps it up. So yeah, fucking thanks so much for listening and watching and hanging out. This has been delightful. If you want to see us cover another patent art, patent project, side project, whatever the hell, throw it in the comments and it'll put it on our radar because we love him and any excuse. We know about Faith No More, right? We're gonna cover Faith No More. Don't fucking throw the obvious at us, but. Uh, yeah, go ahead and follow me on all social media at Pander Monkey and Alex on Instagram at Every Album Alex. And please support our history guy Tom Osmond at Tom Osmond Sounds on all social media, as well as Tom Osmond Sounds.com for all his music in, and then Tom Osmond.subsec.com. Uh, he's got a podcast on there. He interviews a bunch of musicians for, uh, for us and for himself. Cool stuff, busy guy. Um, and yeah, let's not forget everybody, patreon.com slash every album ever. 
That's where you go. You get bonus episodes. You get to see our schedule in advance. Get to vote on polls to decide who we cover next. Uh, you get to join our Discord. Be a part of our community. Uh, and that's also where you can suggest our um, EA singles. So basically, if an album, an album came out this year and you want to hear us talk about it, throw it on there. We'll pick it out to an episode. Um, and if you're tier two, if you're bigger than Jesus, then you can suggest a full discography for us to cover on our bigger, longer, numbered, full episodes. In addition to being able to request any album from any discography for us to do an episode on uh, a bonus Patreon episode on. So there's plenty of meat and juice there. There's a, that's a fun time. Go and do that. Yes, yes, yes. I also have an EP. Check out the EP. There's a link in the description. Cool, rad. Uh, yeah, I think that about does it. So Alex Choice, what are we wrapping it with? Let's, let's throw on Sucker. Hell yeah. So thank you so much for listening and watching. See ya.